This is Join Us in France, episode 388. 388. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France. Everyday life in France, great places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy, and news related to travel to France. Today, I bring you a conversation with Elise Riven of Toulouse Guided Walks about the crusade against the Cathars and the places you can still visit today that bear witness to this frightful crusade. Today the landscape is breathtaking and Cathar country is a wonderful place to visit any time of year because the weather is so pleasant there. It is also one of those places in the south of France where real estate prices are still reasonable for those of you who are thinking about finding your place in the sun in France. After the interview, I'll share a French tip of the week, which I haven't done in a while, a quick update on French news, and quite a bit about travel news this time. This podcast is supported by donors and listeners who buy my tours and services, including my itinerary consult and my GPS self-guided tours of Paris. You can browse all of that at Annie's Boutique, joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. On the podcast Facebook group, Jill Walsh wrote, Annie Sargent, just to say thank you so much for your audio tour of the Latin Quarter, which I took last week on my visit to Paris. Loved it. Really insightful and enjoyable. I must rewatch Midnight in Paris. <laughs> yes, those of you who've taken the tour will understand the reference. Thank you, Jill. A day spent in the Latin Quarter is a good day for sure. Another great way to stay in touch with Travel to France and podcast news is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. And now that I have a podcast editor, I may actually have time to write more regular newsletters. At least that's the plan. <laughs> Bonjour Elise. Bonjour Annie. We have an exciting program today of uh, things that gratefully happened long, long ago that we don't have to worry about today. That's going to be our episode about the crusade against the Cathars and how it ended in Montségur. Yes. And it was really a nasty time for these poor people. Now, we did a previous episode about kind of the theology of the Cathars and what brought all these people into this movement. And if you haven't listened to that one, it might be a good idea to do so at some point because it will make things a little bit easier to understand. A little bit easier to understand why there was this terrible war. Yeah, this very terrible war. We can call this a crusade, which it was, I guess, officially considered to be by the church, by the Roman Catholic Church. We call it a crusade. You might also consider it as a civil war in the region of Occitania. And we're talking about something that happened 800 years ago. Yeah. In fact, it covered a period from the year 1209, officially beginning in the year 1209, and ending with this finale, if you want to call it that, this tragic uh, ending in the year 1243. Okay. But the war itself officially was a period of 20 years. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about is a war that was a war of religion, but was also a war for conquest of territory. It was extraordinarily bloody and brutal. And unfortunately, there was no such thing as moderation at that time. Not that there is today that much, but it was even worse back in those days. Mm -hmm. And just to make sure everybody situates this a little bit, we're talking about a time 800 years ago when Occitania was a separate kingdom. Aquitaine was a separate kingdom. Everyone has heard of Eleanor of Aquitaine. These were kingdoms run by dukes or counts who were considered to be under the influence or power of both the Roman Catholic Church and the King of France, but the King of France actually didn't control or own these territories. So at the same time, it was a religious war. It was also a war of conquest. Right. It really was. So how did this all begin? Well, 
as Annie very, very, uh, very carefully and, and in great detail explained in the podcast about the Qatar, the Qatar was a new Christian movement that took hold and really, really took quite amazingly in the southwest of what is now France. And that had started about 100 years before. Little by little, all of a sudden, the Pope, who was, of course, the most, I say, the most predominant political person in Western Europe at the time, suddenly realized that the influence of all of these new people, this group that we call the Qatar, was far too much, and it was taking people out of the church, and it was really disturbing the equilibrium of things. And there had been an attempt, more or less, I'd say a half-hearted attempt, to find other ways of dealing with this problem. And then there was a a man who is extremely important, and he'll he'll be important later on in talking about what happened, a, a man who was originally from Spain named Dominique Guzman, who was an envoy of the Pope. He was sent to this area, right around where we are, and going towards Carcassonne and Narbonne and all of that. And he was basically sent to check things out and see what could be done to bring people back to the Roman Catholic Church. And he came through this area with a couple of other emissaries and uh, wrote back some reports to Rome. And after several years of traveling around the whole Southwest, basically he wrote back and said, I don't think there's anything we can do. (laughs) We have to get rid of them. Oh, wow. We just have to get rid of them. They don't want to be convinced. There's no way of talking to these people. Occasionally there's somebody who says, okay, I'll renounce this new religion and, and come back to the church. But somehow the majority of these people, they're just not ready to come back. Mm-hmm. And so the Pope, who at this time was very, very, very powerful, he said, in that case, we really have to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. And by get rid of them, he literally meant exterminate these people. Wow. It wasn't just trying to reconvert them back to the church. This is what makes this so extraordinary, right? And so an army was created. And what did he do to make this army? Well, he went to his most loyal servant, who was the king of France, who was up there in his kingdom up around the Ile de France in Paris. And he said, you get uh, your best noble warriors, your dukes and counts who are loyal to you, and I give you the money, you create an army. We're going to go down. We're going to go down through the Rhone Valley, come all the way down, and we're going to try and wipe out this new movement, and we're going to take back the territory and bring it back to the church. And it's very interesting because it's both take back the territory and bring it back to the church. It's not just one. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, an army that is estimated to be between 30 and 40,000 people, which is huge, What was organized. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of them were mercenary. Many were the knights and chevaliers who were loyal to their specific count or duke or whatever. Most of these are, of course, all people from the north. And they needed someone to be the head of the army. The problem was that the two highest noblemen in this group didn't like each other. And the king realized that it was just going to cause trouble if one of them became the head of the army and not the other. Mm -hmm. So they decided that it wouldn't be neither and that it would be a man who actually was a Cistercian monk, believe it or not. And his name was Arnaud Amory. And he was loyal to only one person, and that was the Pope. And he was made head of this expedition. And they officially called it a crusade. Mm -hmm. Religious take back the country from these horrible heretics. Mm -hmm. These were horrible heretics. And they started going down the Rhone Valley in the beginning of the year 1209. How long it took, I don't know. But the very first place that they stopped is one of the most significant because it's famous in history. It's famous for where it was and what happened there. And that is the town of Béziers. They arrived in Béziers in May of 1209. Béziers uh, is still very picturesque, and a good part of it is up on the hill. You can see it from very far away. At the time, it was a fairly important city, completely surrounded by two sets of ramparts. Mm -hmm. And it was considered to be very safe, impregnable. I love that word, impregnable. Somehow it has to do with pregnant, but impregnable, (laughs) right? And the local people inside Béziers 
Nobody knows exactly how many of them were members of this new movement called the Qatar. But very often it was people in the same family, some of whom had converted and some of whom had stayed Roman Catholic. Let's say maybe maybe 50% of the population, who knows? Nobody really has any idea. There were probably six or 7,000 people living inside this city, this walled city. And of course, this army was an enormous army with an endless amount of money attached to it. And so they surrounded Bézier. But the people inside the walls thought that all they had to do was stay there and that eventually the army would simply go somewhere else because they could not get inside. They were high up on a hill, the walls. It's quite impressive to see even today. Unfortunately, unfortunately, what happened was that several very thoughtless, stupid, I don't know Mm. what the word Mm. is, you know, mindless, irresponsible, oh my goodness, you know, people, we don't even know how many. At some moment when this French army was surrounding them with all of the the machinery that you can imagine of the Middle Ages, there was some small door in the ramparts that they went out at night thinking that nobody would see them and that they could go and get water. I'm sure they had wells inside, but they needed to supply themselves with something. And so they opened this door. And unfortunately for them and for everybody else in Bézier, they were seen. Mm -hmm. And so the very, very infamous siege of Bézier began. And what happened was that the huge French army, the Pope's army, managed to enter the city, the walled city of Bézier. And when the soldiers started fighting, they did not know who they were supposed to be fighting because everybody looked the same. Yeah. I mean, they were just men and women and children who were living there and they looked like everybody. Everybody looked the same. And so there is a wonderful story. Nobody knows if it's exactly true that one of the heads of the army turned to this Arno Amori and said, who do we kill? How do we know who is a Qatar? Yeah. And he turned around and he said to them, kill them all. God will know. Yeah. And what did happen for sure is that the entire population of Bézier was massacred. Yeah. And it has gone down in history as one of the worst moments in this incredibly infamous crusade against the Qatar. Yeah, I guess another word for crusade is genocide. In this case, it it was definitely set up to be an ethnic cleansing, let's say, you know, in the sense that it's a genocide against a group of people who are thinking differently. Right. Right. So these are people who have a different outlook on life. They don't look very different. No. You know, they are like everybody else was in the south of France. Right. And this is one of the reasons why they couldn't tell them apart. They couldn't tell them apart. No. They were no different. They were no different. Now, the Battle of Bézier ended at the end of May. It happens that a very important person, one of the next important people in this story, is the Viscount Roger Trencavel, one of my heroes in this story. This young Viscount, his home was in the Chateau of Carcassonne, which okay. I'm sure some of you have already seen. Right. When it, you go to Carcassonne, you hear about the Trencavel. You hear about the Trencavel. The Trencavel were an extremely important and powerful family in the Southwest. They were first cousins with the Counts of Toulouse, but they were the leaders and they were the lords of Bézier, of Carcassonne, of Albi, of Minerve, which is a small town now in that area, and of a whole region around Carcassonne called the Razès, the region of the Razès. And it happens that he had been in Bézier just a few days before the attack that killed everybody. And he was under the impression that Bézier was safe. And so what happened was he left, he went back with some of his knights to Carcassonne, which is a good distance away actually from Bézier because you have to kind of go further down and south and then further west. And he said, we can prepare here. We know that the army is going to come around. They're going to come all the way down to Narbonne and then they're going to start coming up towards us, heading eventually towards Toulouse, which is the ultimate uh, prize that they wanted. So we can be sure that Bézier is safe we can organize ourselves here. It happens that when he got to Carcassonne, he did not know right away that 
everyone had been killed in Beziers. And he himself had a problem, and that was that although everybody was related, they were all cousins. So he was cousin of Pierre of Aragon, who was technically in Spain, but who was one of their cousins. He was first cousins with the Count of Toulouse. He was first cousins with the Count of Foix. But divide and conquer, this is always what happens. He tried to convince all of these different rulers to join with him to make one unified army to fight this mass coming down from the north. Mm -hmm. And for various reasons that were mostly political, several of them refused. Mm. Pierre of Aragon refused because he was worried that the war would carry over to the other side of the Pyrenees into Aragon. The Count of Toulouse, who at this time was Raymond VI, because the last Raymond was the Raymond VII, but this is his father, Raymond VI, he was what the French would call mou. <laughs> soft. Soft. Yeah. And soft in the sense of being wishy-washy. He was at the same time relatively tolerant. He was not a Qatar. He was still a member of the Roman Catholic Church, but he kind of let everybody do what they wanted to do. He didn't bother anybody. However, because of that, he was starting to get a lot of pressure on him from the Pope. And finally, the Pope said to him, if you side with your cousin, the Trencavel, and create an army against us, you're going to be excommunicated. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, in that case, I'll fight with you against my cousin, Trencavel. Mm. And so the first part of this battle that sort of happened to be around Carcassonne, Raymond, the Count of Toulouse, actually fought against his cousin. And what happened then was that two months later in July of 1209, because 1209 is really, really, really important, this huge army, which had already gone through all of the villages from Narbonne going towards Carcassonne, and you can still see some of them. You have the village of Bram, you have villages uh, all along the way. They managed to kill a whole bunch of people along the way. They encircled Carcassonne. Now, some of you know, Carcassonne is really hard to imagine being attacked. Mm -hmm. It's this enormous double-walled city. Of course, at the time, it was a single-walled city. But it's up on this enormous promontory. It's very well defended. It's very steep on three sides. And Trent Cavell, who did have some other troops with his own troops, he assumed that he could stave off all of these armies. And so he invited the entire local population to come in and be safe inside the walls of Carcassonne, mm -hmm. which means that, again, we're talking about six, 7,000 people. And yeah, apparently Carcassonne was very heavily populated. Heavy populated. Yeah, very p densely packed with people. Right, right. And what I had read was more between 30,000 and 40,000. I don't think you can actually put that many people inside Carcassonne. Yeah, it's I hard really to don't. imagine. It's hard sure. to imagine. Yeah. In any event, what did happen was that he offered refuge to all the peasants, all the people who were working and living in the outlying lands right around the city. And of course, he had his chateau inside the city of Carcassonne. And so they all went inside the city. And it is a fact that this was in July. It is very hot in the summertime in and around Carcassonne. We're in the south of France. And so what happened was they did not have enough water. Right. This is a time when even if you have wells, they dry up. They dry up. And of course, we're talking about limestone. The water just seeps right through. It's yeah. very hard to keep it going. After a siege of several weeks, Trent Cavell, who was 24 at the time, he was 24 years old. He was married. He had a two-year-old son. He realized that the entire population that was his responsibility, and maybe it was 10,000 people or 12,000, I doubt very much if it was 30,000, but certainly it was packed, 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 and you can imagine the sanitary conditions anyway. He said, I will negotiate, I will give myself up if people are allowed to leave and not be killed. And that is exactly what he did. He sent an emissary to the heads of the army, and he said, if you allow the people under my jurisdiction, if you will, to leave, I will give myself up. And the gates were opened. 
people were allowed to flee, but they were forced to leave. They were forced to leave Karkasan. They could not go back to their homes or anything. They were just forced to go as far away as possible. Yeah, apparently they were forced to leave, leaving everything behind. Leaving everything behind. Yeah. Everything. And he was taken prisoner in July of 1209 in the dungeon in his own chateau inside Carcassonne. And by this time, there was a new man who was the head of the army. And that is a man who is the man you're going to go s when you listen to this podcast. <laughs> His name was Simon de Montfort. And he was a baron from Normandy. He actually had lands in England, in Leicester, or in the area around Leicester. He was a seasoned warrior. And what happened was that because the army was starting to kind of be disorganized, they really needed someone who was a good general. And so they found him because they had asked a whole bunch of other people and everybody kept saying, no, thank you. Hmm. We don't want to get involved in this. This is too nasty for us. And he said, yes, I will do this and I will conquer all of this territory if afterwards I become the Lord taking the place of the Count of Toulouse. And so whatever, I don't know if they signed contracts or not in those days, you know, or whether it was just a handshake, but he was in his middle fifties and his son, one of his sons who was a warrior and, and they brought other soldiers with them coming from Normandy. He, by this time took over. So he was in charge of the siege of Carcassonne. And so it was Simon de Montfort, or Simon de Montfort, boo, who, yes. his, who <laughs> was the head of this incredible army that totally surrounded the Carcassonne. And when uh, Roger Trencavel was led into the dungeon and they let all these people out, of course, they basically exiled them all from Carcassonne, he took Carcassonne as his headquarters. And he stayed there. That was his headquarters for the rest of the time that he was alive. And hopefully you will find out soon why he was no longer alive mm -hmm. after a certain time. And from there, they proceeded to work their way going basically west, northwest, with the ultimate goal being to take Toulouse. And once they took Toulouse, the war would be over. Yeah. Along the way... Because Trencavel's territory included Albi, which was, of course, if you know a little bit now about the geography, after taking control of Carcassonne and as they headed towards Toulouse, Simon de Montfort gathered part of his army and included some local people who were doing basically what we'd call a turncoat. They were decided that they were no longer going to defend the Qatar. So there were even knights and soldiers who were originally helping the Qatar, who suddenly decided, no, this is not a good idea. Let's save our own necks. We're going to go fight with Simon de Montfort. Mm. And as they were going towards Albi, which is basically north and west uh, of Carcassonne, they also targeted a small town named Lavor, which is still a lovely little town of about 15,000 people. That's about 35, 40 kilometers north of Toulouse. Mm. It's on the road... It's a little bit off, but it's basically on the route. It's like the triangular route between here and Albi. You have Lavor. And why did they go to Lavor? Well, Lavor was interesting because at the time, and of course we're talking 800 years ago, it was a hotbed of Qatar. Mm. It was an important walled city. Uh, now there are no walls left to see. There's still a very beautiful old city center, but it's really, really very small. But at the time, it was one of the most important centers. And there was a bishop, a Qatar bishop, who actually lived in Lavar. And the lady who was the equivalent of a lord who was in charge of Lavar was a woman named Dame Giraud. She was a widow. Her husband had been killed in a prior battle. She had become a parfait. She had become basically a priestess of the Qatar. So had two of her children. And her son, who was a knight, who originally was not part of the religion and who was really kind of trying to decide whether he wanted to help defend his mom and her city or not, what happened was he got menaced by some of the soldiers from Simone de Montfort's army. And in reaction, he decided he was going to stay and help his mom in Lavar. And so a good chunk of Simone de Montfort's army sort of broke off and went to attack Lavar. And they did manage to attack it, even though it was walled like most cities were at the time. And what happened there, since it was in a city where everyone 
had become a Qatar, a member of the new religion, whether they were priests or not, everyone, 100% of them were Qatar, was once they managed to attack the city, there was a bit of a defense. But again, Raymond VI, who I've come after going back and doing my research to really dislike in this story, he promised them because they were under his jurisdiction that he would help and send soldiers. And in the end, he never did. Mm. And Trent Cavell was already in prison and the Count of Foix was far too south and he was worried about what was going to happen where he was. So he was not going to get rid of his soldiers to go help them. And so they were attacked. Everybody was taken prisoner. A few people were, they said, oh, we, we changed our minds. You know, we'll come back to the church. You got your life saved that way. You know, the rest of them were killed just like in Béziers. And Dame Giraud was put into a pit and she was lapidated, and then she was burned. And she was considered to be one of the heroines, one of the stoic women who actually resisted to the last minute, but they managed to take Lavor. Mm. And then they went to Albi, where most of the people basically decided to reconvert back to Catholicism. And so they did not attack Albi at all. They just basically made a U-turn and decided to head back south towards Toulouse. So what we have is, we have major sites, we have Bézier, we have Carcassonne, we have Lavore, and then we finally get to Toulouse. And Toulouse had three major battles. The first battle was basically pathetically defended by Raymond VI and his army. And part of the problem with this was that not all the knights wanted to go and fight against this humongous army that was coming to encircle the city. Now, Toulouse was walled. You know, we know that yeah. Toulouse was a walled city. It was a very big city. Even at the time, it was 35,000, 40,000 people inside Toulouse. It was defended by everybody for the simple reason that people did not want their city to be invaded and because the Count of Toulouse was their king, in a sense. They did not want to be taken over by the king of France. So it wasn't that it was filled with Qatar. There were a fair number of Qatar in the city, but the entire population did defend the city. But that did not help. And so in 1213, the city was taken by Simone de Montfort. What happened, however was that as Simone de Montfort continued battles, he went to a town called Muret, south of Toulouse. He turned towards the Pyrenees to go and attack Foix, which is in the foothills, of course, in the Pyrenees. He started to kind of encircle the entire territory. The fact that they occupied this area created more and more resentment and hostility, so that several years later, there was what was called the Revolt of the Barons. Mm -hmm. And there was the second major battle around Toulouse, where various different local noblemen tried to reorganize an army. Ultimately, what happened was that they never were able to bring everybody together. And this is really what made the great defeat in the southwest of France, was that they could not unify everybody. Every lord was worried about his own little territory, so they didn't want to sacrifice their soldiers in case they all got killed. What happened, though, was that Pierre, the king of Aragon, decided that maybe it was time to help his cousin, Raymond VI. And so he sent his troops and he came himself to Muret, which is really, what, 25, 30 kilometers south of Toulouse. Yeah. And there was this huge battle with an enormous part of the soldiers from Simone de Montfort. And guess what happens? Pierre of Aragon gets killed. And when he gets killed, what do his soldiers do? They skedaddle. They go back to Aragon on the other side of the Pyrenees. And there is Raymond VI with this kind of pathetic army. And so Toulouse is held by Simone de Montfort. We come up a few years later. This is really getting to be a kind of a permanent situation in the area. But there's a kind of swell of resentment because Simone de Montfort was repressive as could be. He was a good soldier, but he was not a good leader in terms of a civil population. Not well liked. Not well liked. And so in 1218, there's a third revolt in Toulouse. And if you come to Toulouse and you go to the city hall, there's a wonderful mural on one of the walls, which shows all the men and women up on the walls, repairing the walls, setting up all of the machinery to defend Toulouse for the third and ultimate time. 
And in 1218, Simone de Montfort, who is really kind of hanging out back in Carcassonne, cushy Carcassonne, you know, he's in his chateau up there. He and his son, who's probably about 30 years old by this time, they take a chunk of their army back to Toulouse because his son says to him, you know, you're really going to have to put out this revolt or we're going to be in trouble because a lot of the soldiers that they had hired were mercenaries and they were leaving. Mm. They were paid to stay for 40 days. What the original sense of the quarantine is, is the idea of 40 days. You get paid for 40 days. You can pillage, take what you want. After 40 days, unless you sign a new contract, you don't have to stay anymore. So their army was getting to be a little bit smaller than it had been before. So Simone de Montfort and his son and what was a good chunk of their army come back to Toulouse and they encircle it. And there's a place where you can still see, there's a plaque that says, this is where Simone de Montfort came to his end. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. And it is right on the outside of the walls on the south side of the city. And what happened was there was such a revolt inside the city. They say that every adult man and woman was on the barricades, on the top of the ramparts with whatever they could but this was not Simon de Montfort's lucky day. Mm. And a catapult with a nice round stone was shot out from the walls, hit him square between the eyes, and... That was the end of him. That was the end of him. It is said, nobody knows for sure, that it was a woman who actually did the catapult ing. I guess we can say, <laughs> not even sure. In any event, on the mural in City Hall, we see a woman basically getting ready to shoot out this stone that indeed killed Simon de Montfort. And what happened then was that his son, who's also named Armory, decided that maybe it was time to regroup, and he took his soldiers back to Carcassonne. However, this is 1218. The war has been going on for nine years. Believe it or not, it's another... 11 years, and 11 years of skirmishes, of fighting, of the different lords taking different positions, of the army regrouping and not, before ultimately what happens is that the French army, with money coming again from the Pope, finally defeats what is left, uh, Trencavels and the Counts of Toulouse soldiers. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for this defeat, ultimately, is because they could not create a unified army at all. And so in the year 1229, tired of war, still Raymond VI, but he's an old man, so now his son Raymond VII, who is basically the last Count of Toulouse, who has basically taken over for him, he sees that they are really never going to win this war. Mm -hmm. And so there is a delegation that comes from Paris, from the king, the king of France, who at this point is Louis VII, and he renders his power. And basically, they say to him, if we can negotiate a treaty, we will stop fighting. We will stop killing. We will just end the war. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, this is what happens. And so in uh, August of 1229... It's called the Treaty of Meaux. Meaux, which is a, actually a city east of, of Paris. Uh, where they make cheese. Where they make brie. Yeah. Yes. He signs a treaty. And this treaty says that he, that is Raymond VII, the last Count of Toulouse, if he does not have a son, a legitimate child, because all of these people had children, but they weren't necessarily legitimate. Yeah. He has one daughter who is a legitimate child. Her name is Jean. She's 12 years old in 1229. And so the treaty says, it stipulates that if he no longer has any more children, any more legitimate children, that at his death, the territory will be given over to his daughter, but his daughter must be married to the king's brother, ah. who is also 12 years old. Because ah. none of these people are very old when you mm -hmm. think about it. You know, some of them were in their early 20s. Some of them were in their early 30s, right? And the brother is the Duke of Orléans. And what happens is that Raymond VII eventually dies. His daughter, who has been taken from him and brought to the court in France, in Paris. And she's been brought up, actually, so she knows this guy 
who she's going to be married to. And, of course, they married them off the nobility and the royalty at 1213, even if they didn't consume the marriage, as they would say, you you know, until later on. So her father dies, having had no more legitimate children. She marries the king's brother. And guess what happens? She never has any children. Ah. And she and her husband, who apparently, according to everything I've read, basically got along. Mm -hmm. They're exactly the same age. They go off on a crusade to Jerusalem together. Oh. Because she's been brought back to the church. I mean, she never was a Qatar anyway, but she's very, you know, very religious. And coming back from a crusade in the year 1251, the two of them die. Mm -hmm. And there you are. What happens is in 1251, the entire region of Occitania officially becomes a part of France. However, what has happened to the Qatar in all of this? Well, the war ends in 1229, but there are still places where there are Qatar. Of course. They're in the cities. They're mostly now in villages hidden away in forests up in the mountains. They're trying to be inconspicuous. Laying low. Laying low. And the Pope says, you know, this is not, enough. This is not good enough. Well, we've gotten the territory back, but we still have not brought enough people back to the church. And so he says, now it's time to try another tactic. Forget this business of the war. What we're going to do is we're going to find a way of bringing individuals in front of a commission. Mm. And the person he says that he wants to take charge of this process is the same guy, Dominique Guzman, who he had sent around right before 1209. So this is already a number of years later. And he says, okay, you are a member of the Dominican order. He was one of the founders of the Dominican order. And the Dominicans are set up here in Toulouse. And they are a preaching order who are inside the city. They're supposed to be devoted to poverty. But the Pope gives them a second mission. And he tells them, you, that is you, the Dominicans under the auspices and the ideas of this man, Dominique Guzman, you're going to create a kind of inquest commission. And you're going to go out and you're going to find people and you're going to bring them in and ask them questions about whether they're heretics or not. And this is what is called the inquisition. Mm -hmm. And it was, unlike what most people think, It was not the Spanish Inquisition that was first. It was this Inquisition here in Toulouse, Mm -hmm. started in the year 1233. That was the very first ever Mm -hmm. of what is officially called an Inquisition. And it was specifically against the Qatar. Because it's interesting to know, because every time I do a visit in Toulouse, I ask people if they think that the Inquisition is Spanish. And just about everybody says yes, you know? I mean, this is what we learn in school outside in the States and in England, that the Inquisition is synonymous with Spain. Well, the Spanish Inquisition was actually inspired by this Inquisition. And in Spain, the Inquisition was against anybody who was not Christian and Catholic. Mm -hmm. In Toulouse, it was only against the Qatar. And just to give an idea, if you were Jewish, and there was a small Jewish population in Toulouse, they didn't even bother with you because you weren't even Christian. Well, if you weren't Christian, you didn't have a soul, so who cared anyway? (laughs) Nobody worried about you, you know? (laughs) It was you were a non-thing, you know? You just didn't matter. You didn't matter. All right, whatever you say. So here we are in the year 1233. And what happens is that the word spreads that it's going to get nasty, really nasty for the few, whatever, hundreds, thousands of Qatar who still live but scattered around, not showing their faces too much. And so there is a man who is uh, a lord, and he is a lord of a small area near Foix, which is a town that's a beautiful, still fortified town south of Toulouse in the Ariège area in the beginning of the Pyrenees. And this man, his name is Roger de Perel. 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 And his family is Qatar. And his wife is Qatar, and she is a cousin of the uh, Countess of Foix, who is a parfait, who is a priestess in the 
Qatar religion, and there are lots of small villages in the foothills of the Pyrenees where lots of the Qatars have gone to live. And so he says, I think that things are going to go badly. We really have to figure out something to protect ourselves. He has, under his dominion in his territory, up on top of a very sharp, what is called a pug, P-O-G. It's a, just a promontory in the middle of the beginning of the Pyrenees. There is a ruin of a castle, a fortified castle that, if you can imagine, we're talking about the 1230s, is old. So what are we talking about? Something that's 100 or 200 years old that needs to be fixed up and modernized. And so he has his knights and all the people he can get gathered together, and he has them go up to the top of this hill. And of course, when you go, as you and I have both gone, you really can imagine how unbelievable the work was to do this because it's so steep and it's up on the top of yeah. this, this very steep, sharp hill. Yes. And in the space of a couple of years, they fix up the castle, the fortified castle. They reinforce the walls around it. They create wells so that they do have water. They create a tunnel Apparently, there is verification that there really was a tunnel that leads down inside because it's limestone and out so that the, some of them can get out and go on missions and go get uh, food and things like that. And a lot of the Qatar come to live in this castle. And then other peasants who are Qatar but don't feel that it's necessary to actually go in, they come and build their little houses nearby on the sides of the mountain, close by down below. And there's this little town of Monségur, which is still there to this day. And they start living there. Now, the Inquisition gets worse and worse. It gets really nasty. They start killing people. They start burning people. They start menacing people. Remember, this is from the 1233 on. By 1240, almost all the Qatar have gone into hiding. And the Pope keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and saying, not enough, not enough. We've got to get rid of these Qatar because whatever is left of them, they're going to influence everybody else. And so finally, an army is created. Unfortunately, it's an army that basically uses a lot of the soldiers that were the soldiers under Simon de Montfort who've managed to take over one town and then another, and they've basically set themselves up down in the southwest of France. So this is still the vestiges of the French army that are there, including a man named Philippe de, de Lévy, who is now the head of Mirepoix, a town nearby. And in 1241, they head for this fortified castle called Montségur, and they surround it. Montségur in Occitan means safe mountain. Yeah. And they surround it. And for a while, they just seem menacing because they do have this tunnel. They have wells. They have ways of getting their provisions in and out. And they have these men called Fédi, which means that these are knights who have had uh, their lands taken away from them because they have fought on the side of the Qatar. And so there's an estimation that maybe there were 50 of them. Doesn't sound like a lot, but apparently it was enough to give a kind of pretty good defense to this castle. There are how many people? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if anybody It's not really very knows. big. It's not very big, but you have to imagine that there were annexed buildings right, on the outside. Right. I remember, actually, I remember you can kind of see remnants on the sides of where right. they used to have huts and whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And apparently there were other pieces that were totally destroyed after eventually they, mm -hmm. it was taken over. And so what happens is starting in 1241, there is this forever and ever siege of Montségur. And it lasts, and it lasts, and it lasts. And the soldiers go away, and they come back, and they go away, and they come back. In the meantime, some people have decided that they just can't deal with this anymore, and they try to escape through the tunnel. Some people apparently manage to really leave, but what they do is they leave. That is, they leave Occitania, they leave France. The last known community of Qatar is actually in Lombardy in northern Italy. I don't have any idea what actually happened to them there, to be honest. Yeah. By 1242, it's getting difficult for the people inside to sustain themselves. And there are people who have left, and so there aren't enough people to defend them. Eventually, what happens is they bring in these catapults, and they bring in these pieces of machinery, of war machinery, and they start 
uh, being able to demolish the walls because it's so steep that just climbing up the walls is not up the side of the mountain is not going. To, takes a long time. Takes a long time, and eventually they manage to br- break through the ramparts, and they take the castle of Montségur. And what do they do? Now, the story is that by this time, there were maybe 300 people left inside, which included some of these knights, and then the rest of them were just people who were Qatar, but very, very religiously. Sure. If they were still there, they were very they religious. Were, they were very religious. They were the ones who were not going to give up under any circumstances. Yeah. And so the head of this army basically says to them, you have 15 days. You can either come out and renounce your faith in this new religion, and we will let you live, or you will be killed. We will surround the walls, we will set everything on fire, and you will die. 15 days. Apparently, there's interesting question about why they allowed them to stay for 15 days. Was it give them time to ruminate about it? In any event, what did happen was that three or four people left through the tunnel. They were the ones that were actually able to tell other people about what happened. Mm. There's a story about a treasure. Nobody knows if that ever really existed or not. You know, Mm. everybody still goes and looks for it. And when the soldiers finally came on that 15th day and they said, who will leave? Nobody. Mm -hmm. Nobody. They said, we will not leave. We will not abjure our faith. And so 244 people were set on fire inside the walls of Montségur. And in the year 1243, that was the end. That was the end of the Qatar in France. That was the end of all rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church until something happened several hundred years later. It's called the French Revolution? It's called the War of Religion with the oh, Protestants. There was that too, yeah. There was that too, 300 years later. And then we get to the revolution. But the war was so intense. So we're talking about a period from 1209 to 1243. And in many ways it makes sense because in a theology like the Cathar, where really the whole point of life is to abandon the worldly body, you know, why would they have fought it? If they are into it that much, they couldn't commit suicide, but they could let themselves be killed. But they let themselves be killed. They let themselves be martyred to their uh, faith. So if you go to Montségur today, it's a lovely place to visit. We'll do that briefly. You just take a nice hike. It takes... I think they say 20 minutes. For me, it was more like 40 minutes. <laughs> it, 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 it's steep. steep. It's steep. It's not paved. Don't bring a stroller. You Wear have to, good shoes. Very good shoes. Bring water. You pay a little bit of money at the entrance. Yeah, it's five fifty per adult. There you go. And two for children. Don't know exactly what the age group is considered to be for children. Yeah, but it is, is now paying. There is a guy there that does tours yes. in French. Yes. I don't know if he does anything in English. Uh, his name is Fabrice, and no, he's the official guide of Montségur, and he does his tours in French. Just once a day, maybe, right? I think in the summer, he probably does one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Yeah. But if you speak French or understand French, he's actually quite good. I yeah. Mean, he yeah. really knows a lot about yeah. it. So it's a lovely place to go. You can visit the little village of Montségur, which is not far. There's not much there, but... There are a couple of cafes. Yeah. There's a little shop. Yeah. It's cute. I mean, it's very cute. But in the ruin itself, it's not like when you exit, you leave through the gift shop or anything like that, no. okay? It's really wilderness. It's really a ruin. Yeah, it's a ruin. You hike up to the ruin, you hike down from the ruin, and then you go get some food somewhere else, okay? There's so. a big parking lot down below. A lot of people, what they do is they picnic down below. There's kind of a, like a meadow. It's very pretty. You have a view. One of the things about Montségur, aside from this history of it, is that it's a site that's spectacular. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And so you can picnic down below and then you go up. But it is really, what you're going up to is really to a, a ruin and to imagine how people lived up there. Right, right. Really. Yeah, and you can see the places where they had holes for the beams, for the floor. So uh, right now, the walls are just 
you know, straight walls. There's n nothing left inside. But you can see where they used to have floors. It used to be a, a chateau with, with uh, different rooms and whatever. Now it's just ruins. Now, not too far from there, there's another one. We don't have time to go into it. But if you want to visit two in a day, you could do Roque Fixade exactly. nearby. And Roque Fixade, I'm not sure what the whole history is there. It Something similar might have happened. I'm really not clear on it. But that one you can drive up to. So it's... You know, for people who have reduced mobility, Rock Fixade is going to be easier than Montségur. And on a good, clear day, you can actually see the ruin of Montségur from Rock Fixade. Yeah, Rock Fixade is on the southern side. And uh, so you're looking, it's on the southern side of the mountain, looking further south. And Montségur yeah. is, is across the way. Yeah, and both are absolutely lovely to visit. Uh, a nice hike for uh, Montségur and a beautiful drive for Rock Fixade. I, I recommend it. I've been there a lot of times, obviously, because I'm from around here. But the story is just fascinating. It's a fascinating story. And it's a wonderful day trip from Toulouse. You can go to Foix, which is not that far away either, the town of Foix, which still has a castle, and then go Montségur. But everyone here knows the story of yeah. the ending of uh, things in Montségur. And if you want to hear all about this, I really recommend a book um, by Zoe... Olden Oldenburg. Oldenburg, called Massacre at Montségur. It's not a recent book, but it's a very well-documented book, and it's in English. So this lady was uh, not French-born, I don't think. She was Russian. Russian, there you go. But she lived in France for a long time, and I think she wrote in French for the most part. If I understand correctly, the book was originally written in French, and okay. then for some reason sells a lot in English. Yeah. Yeah, because it's one of the few that's like meaty. I mean, that book goes into the whole history of the Southwest and it's really a, a very, very well done, very interesting book. So I will put a link to that book in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Elise. It was lovely to learn all about this. I kind of knew it, but at the same time, it's a beautiful refresher and such dramatic events. Such in the dramatic South events. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, Elise. Oh, thank you, Annie. Au revoir. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us, no spaces or dashes. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you for a long time, you are wonderful. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Deborah Swindlehurst, Michelle Jensen, Judy Wise, and Barbara Schmidt. Thank you so much for becoming patrons and making this podcast possible. This week, I asked my patrons what they'd like to hear more of on the podcast, and their responses were very insightful. I'll share a video with them, letting them know uh, what's going to happen with the podcast very soon. And this week, I also shared a recipe for tarte à la tomate, a quick, easy, tasty, and healthy lunch. Let me remind all donors and podcast guests that all the rewards I post on Patreon are also on addictedtofrance.com. And if you've donated to the show or have been a guest on the podcast, you should have a personal login to that. Another way to support this podcast is to hire me to be your itinerary consultant. Here's how it works. You purchase the service on joinusinfrance.com for slash boutique. Then you tell me all about your dream trip to France and I help you craft the details. What customers like best about it is that I spend an hour on the phone with them. They get to ask me all their questions and I enjoy talking to them as well uh, because all of them have been listening to the show for a while. And so it's wonderful. It's a great experience for everybody. Okay, the French expression of the week. I asked the Facebook group what I should do for the French tip of the week, and several asked for help on how to say village and city names. And I'm happy to help you with that, but you've got to tell me what names, because I can't explain the rules, since there aren't any. <laughs> 
So Don gave me a short list of difficult names. So let's play. How do you say R-E-I-M-S? That's the city where French kings were crowned and where they make champagne. R-E-I-M-S is Reims. Reims. Yeah, to say it perfectly, you have to get your R going, right? It takes some practice. But even if you don't do the R exactly right, it's Reims. Okay? How about R O U E N? Lovely city on the banks of the Seine River in Brittany. R O U E N is Rouen, of course. Rouen again starts with an R, so R R R Rouen. <laughs> How about C A E N? How would you say that? When you poll French people, what city they would choose if they could live anywhere in France, they often say that C-A-E-N is one of their top choices. Hmm. C-A-E-N is Caen. You say it exactly like Caen, Q-U-A-N-D, which means when. Quand le train de Caen va-t-il arriver Quand le train de Caen va-t-il arriver? See, that one's easy. Quand is like when. Here's another one. That's the last one. And that one, French people might hesitate how to say that one. It's T-R-O-Y-E-S. T-R-O-Y-E-S. Give it a try. All right. Vous donnez votre langue au chat. T-R-O-Y-E-S is trois, just like the number three, trois, un, deux, trois. T-R-O-Y-E-S is said just like the number three. Les trois mousquetaires ne venaient pas de trois. <laughs> okay, so if you think we're ridiculous in French and too complicated, whatever, English is not a lot better. I'll just say a few names for you. Lester. Worcestershire, and Schenectady, New York. Schenectady. Do you even know how to spell that? I had to look it up. <laughs> and the capital of South Dakota is spelled Pierre. And you say Pierre. Really? Pierre. The capital of Idaho is Boise. And it should be Boise. Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines. Okay, so, you know, languages, names, they are complicated. So just remember how we say those names and just don't worry about it. Just memorize it. That's how it works. Reims, Rouen, Caen, Trois. Voilà. This week in French news. Well, French news has concentrated on what's happening in Ukraine. A lot of talk about the need to not buy any more gas or oil from Russia. And also, the big news this week has been about the upcoming elections of our legislatures. The French Parliament is a vital institution with 577 députés who come from all over France. They are elected locally but represent the whole nation. My député has nothing to do with running my district. If the leaves are not getting picked up, that's for the mayor to address. But if a local factory pollutes too much, residents will probably complain to their député and he or she would push a law that applies to the whole country. The député get selected locally because there's an apportionment based on population density. But really, they mostly work on national issues and most of them live in Paris much of the time. What's happening right now is that political parties are making agreements what persons they are going to run, who will bow out in favor of whom in the second round of votes, if it's tight and it's usually tight, they are all uh, trying to save their skin <laughs> and keep as many seats as possible. Politicians all have grand ideas and theories until it's clear that they might lose their seat and then they are open to all sorts of compromises, even ones that are a bit shocking. So 
time will tell what will happen. We vote in June. As far as travel to France is concerned, we are seeing a continued uptick in the number of visitors from English-speaking countries from all over Europe, but very few Asian visitors still. I think the 2022 summer season is going to be much busier than the 2021 season. Make sure to reserve hotels, restaurants, and venues that are popular because there are going to be lots of people everywhere. There are no restrictions on travel whatsoever right now in France. The only place where you need to wear a mask is in public transportation. Some people choose to wear a mask in stores, but most people are back to not wearing masks while shopping. No more vaccine passes or anything like that, except a few exceptions that have to do with visiting nursing homes and hospitals. A few restaurants and venues have not reopened since the pandemic, but it's only a small proportion. And it's hard to tell if that's due to the fact that the hospitality industry in France is having a hard time recruiting enough employees or some other, you know, factor like the owner decided to do something else with their lives. The virus is still circulating in France, and of course, I mean the COVID-19 virus, but the number of new cases is now below 50,000 per day, and of those 50,000, only a very few get sick enough to need to see a doctor. Right now, in all of France, there are fewer than 1,500 patients in the ICU for covid it is extremely rare to have a fully vaccinated person experience more than just cold symptoms. But we still have people who refuse to get vaccinated and they still could get very sick from this virus and die, unfortunately. Thankfully, we have high vaccination rates in France and everybody has COVID tests because they are cheap and easy to find. As soon as we get the sniffles, we get tested. And if it's positive, we stay home. And if you're going to need to get a COVID test before flying home, just go to the nearest pharmacy the day before your trip and they will be able to accommodate you. Now, if you need a test on a Sunday or on a holiday, you need to think it through a little more, okay? But on a regular business day, you can get a test very easily just about anywhere in France. For my personal update this week, I'm reading a book about an artist who was a force of nature and very successful in her lifetime, and you've probably never heard of her. She is Rosa Bonheur. Her paintings are stunning, and we're hearing about her right now a lot more in France because she was born 200 years ago. The book is called Art is a Tyrant, and I'm reading it because Elise and I will soon record an episode about her. She spent the last part of her long life in a chateau in Tomery, not far from Paris. This chateau is open to the public, and you can visit her workshop and a museum dedicated to her. I haven't seen it personally, and I'm not sure if Elise has or not. If any of you have visited it, I would love to hear from you to see what the visit was like. I'll be visiting a couple of towns in the Tarn this weekend. The weather is lovely and I feel like looking around. I'm not sure which ones I'll go to yet, but it's so close to home. It doesn't take a lot of planning for me. A scenic drive with stops in medieval villages sounds good to me for a holiday weekend. Today, Sunday, May 8th, Eighth is a holiday. It falls on a Sunday, so it doesn't change much. But watch out. Next year, both May 1st and May 8th are going to be on a Monday, which means almost everyone in France will get a long weekend. And it's going to be a really busy week in hotels and restaurants. But I'll talk about that more next year. But just put a bug in your ear. Next year, May 1st, May 8th are going to be a little bit trickier. I test drove an electric car this week. I watched lots of YouTube reviews of the MG ZS EV and decided to give it a try. And I like it. It fits all my requirements. Uh, in France, they are being sold through the Nissan dealerships. It has a big trunk, long range, fast recharge capabilities for long trips. 
Smooth ride, uh, good cameras all around. I don't have a single camera in my car right now because it's so old. I can get it with a tow ball for my electric bike, and it's not too expensive. So nothing fancy but a nice car, and we keep our cars a long time in our family, and mine is on its last leg. <laughs> And I can't get an EV without ordering it. And even if I ordered it today, which I won't, uh, I probably won't get it until the end of the year. So it takes some planning. I haven't decided for sure yet, but I'm actively looking and that one seems like a good choice. Show notes and full transcript for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com for slash 388, the numeral. If you are planning a trip to France or someone you know is planning a trip to France, search the website to see if we've talked about that place because we've talked about an awful lot of places. Next week on the podcast, an episode about how to adapt classic French recipes to a vegan lifestyle with Sarla Terpstra. A lot of French food can be made vegetarian and vegan, and since both Sarla and I have written cookbooks about French food, we had a great conversation and I think you will enjoy it. Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2022 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.